here is the subject for, for today, and it's on incident investigation. And I entitled this Never Again. Um, and the thought behind that was we see many, too many accidents happening over and over again. Um, Mike and I get, uh, get an email every day that shows all of the new claims. And as we read through those, very rarely are we surprised by something new. Occasionally, that's, that's the excitement for the day. Whoa, they did what? <laughs> um, but what we find is that we repeat the same problems over and over again. And we have a hard time fixing those issues. Um, we have taken a lot of time over the years talking about incident investigation, talking about the process to try to prevent accidents. And, uh, and invariably, it seems like we, we end up leaning towards, um, is, was somebody at fault? Was this preventable? Um, and questions like that. And, we, and many times we don't spend as much time on how do we prevent this from happening again? Um, those who do not learn from their mistakes are bound to repeat them. Now, I found a lot of people had been quoted, had been credited with that quote. And so, so I just threw it up here blank. We'll call it anonymous. But uh, I think all of us pretty much, pretty much believe this, that, you know what? If I don't learn that lesson, it's going to happen again. And so how do we learn those lessons? That's really what we're talking about today. I want to start out with a statement and see what you think about this. All accidents are preventable. Do you agree with that? Is that something that, that you, would, you would agree that we could prevent accidents? Now, as we do defensive driving training, we talk about preventable collisions. And, and if there's a police officer in the room, uh, somebody who's responded to accidents, I like to ask them the question, what percentage of, of accidents do you think are preventable? Do you know what their, their response is uh, most of the time? Um, they say it's 100% or 90% or almost all of them. And you know what? I tend to, I tend to, uh, to agree with that. I think accidents are, are preventable, um, and, uh, and if we'll learn from those accidents, we can prevent those. Now, I'd, be, I'd love to have comments on that. Some people may disagree with that, and I, I think there's always that meteorite that can fall out of the sky and, and, and hit you on the head, um, and that's pretty tough to prevent those types of things, but really the vast majority of those accidents are preventable. So if we go into it with that idea, then we have <clears throat> the ability to go a lot deeper than we may otherwise, and, and we have the attitude to be successful going into this. Um, another thing uh, is that accidents are caused. Accidents are caused by unsafe acts and unsafe conditions us doing something or a hazard that we haven't recognized, right? We haven't, uh, we haven't abated or done something to control that hazard. Those things cause accidents. People cause accidents. Okay. So there's a couple of points going into this. Let's, let's go a little bit, uh, a little bit further into this. Our overall goal today is to prevent incidents through learning and corrective action. Well, but I wanted to start off with some definitions because I've used a couple of terms already. I said accident. Well, what is an accident? Accident is an unplanned, undesired event that results in personal injury or property damage. Um, what's an incident? An occurrence, condition, or, or situation arising in the course of work that resulted in or could have resulted in injuries, illness, damage to health or, or fatalities. Well, a couple of different definitions, and there, there are dozens of them out there. And you ask yourself the question, what's the difference between an accident and an incident? And many times we use those interchangeably, and I, I, and I do that. There are a lot of people in the, in the safety world that are, that are adamant that we have to use the word incident. And we go along with that. I'm not quite as adamant that way. I don't mind using those terms interchangeably. The problem with the word accident is many people say, well, that's, that gives us, a, give us the uh, impression that it's random, that it is something that, that we really don't have control over. So, okay, I'll get that and, and I'll, I'll take that angle. 
um, as we go through here, but I may use these words inter interchangeably, but let's look at that. An incident is something bad um, that happens or potentially could happen. So incidents could also include things like near misses. Uh, or close calls might be a term that we can uh, that we can use for that. What is what does a near miss mean? It's an it's an instant where no property damage and property was damaged and no personal injury sustained, but where given a slight shift in time or position, damage and or injury could easily have occurred. And I think most of us understand what a what a near miss is, um, and sometimes though we may not. Um, realize just how serious those things could be. Uh, I can think of a few of those near misses that I've had on the uh, on the road. We drive a lot for for our work here at the trust, and I've had a few near misses that as I as I um, got through the incident down the road a few miles or maybe a day or so later, it really hit me how potentially serious that could have been. Well, near misses are part of our overall investigation process. Well, we asked the question, what incidents do we need to investigate? Do I need to investigate a paper cut? Um, do I need to investigate uh, every little thing that happens out there? Well, let's start really kind of from the, from the obvious. If there's a reportable or recordable incident, if there's a fatality, if there's somebody has to go to the hospital, if we destroy some property, we burn down a building, obviously we're going to investigate the big ones. Um, property damage, those are other things where, where we're going to investigate. Close calls, we ask a question about that. Do I investigate close calls? And I think, and, and do I investigate those paper cuts? Well, the rule that I go by and, and say is we should investigate everything. Now, how much energy are we going to put into the investigation of a paper cut? Well, not a whole lot. We should report everything, right? If I get injured on the job, if I, prop, if I damage some property, I need to report that. Why is that so? Why is that so important? Some out there are like, well, it's really minor. You know what? It just it, it, those those things happen. Now we're probably not going to spend a lot of a uh, lot of effort on paper cuts, unless maybe I work in an area where we're handling paper all day long, and that may be that may be something that could uh, result in a significant injury. I always talk about the Band-Aid rule. Watch out for the Band-Aids. Watch out for the duct tape. Look, look for the problem or the uh, simple things that may be an indicator of a bigger problem. I investigated a, an accident at one, at one point in my career, early on in my career, where a guy had had a really nasty cut. He cut his hand and it, and it severed tendons in his hand. And so he had to have surgery. His hand was never going to be the same. Um, so it was, a, it was a significant thing. I went to the location where this incident happened. It, it was a uh, assembly line process where they were putting widgets together. And uh, and so I got there and I just kind of looked around. I try to I try to take in the overall area before I start asking questions or or diving in too much. And I and I noted one quick thing, and that was every person that worked in the area where the incident happened had at least one Band-Aid on their finger or hand or somewhere on their body. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I, I pulled one person aside and I said, asked him several questions, but I asked about the Band-Aid. Hey, what, why the Band-Aid? And the, and the response was, oh, there's this part, it's got a sharp burr on it, and we get cut on it, put a Band-Aid on it. Okay. And I went through every person in that department, and every person had at least one Band-Aid, and they reported the exact same thing. Oh, there's this one part that's got a sharp burr on it, and we get cut. Um, and, uh, as I did my investigation, I found the, the part that this person had been cut on that had severed tendons in his hand was the exact same part that these people reported was, was responsible for their band-aids. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, whoops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. What do I mean uh, by that? Wow, I can't seem to make anything work on my computer. <laughs> Hold on a second, folks. Oh, challenges. 
Um, what do I what do I mean by this? Um, we got to watch for the duct tape. We got to watch for the band aids. That's maybe an indicator that something bad is going to happen. The same thing goes when we uh, when we look at near misses. I may have several near misses that that tip me off that we might kill somebody. We may we may uh, cause our building to burn down. We may you name it. Keep going on that list. So we've got to watch for for those things as well. Okay. Uh, but we've got to remember that if we're going to investigate, we, everything has to re be reported. So incident investigation starts with a, with a policy and a rule that every incident has to be reported and it needs to be reported in a timely manner. Um, and so the rule that I would talk about is that any, in, any injury or any accident needs to be reported uh, immediately to the supervisor. Supervisors are the first person on the scene. They're the person that's there to gather that information. They know the job and they can protect others. So report there. Supervisors need to report that in to whoever is your central person, your designated safety officer um, or the person that makes claims or management, whoever you designate. Um, I, would, I would recommend that it always goes to top management. We had an incident that caused somebody to go get medical treatment. The, the top manager should know that information. So have that policy in place, report it immediately, um, and supervisors need to get that to the, to the top management by the end of the shift. All right, so we've had an accident. What do we do now? Well, it's important that, uh, that we ensure that everybody's safe. So we may have to stand back. We may have to evacuate an area. We may have to shut down equipment. Um, we, need, we may need to get off the highway. Uh, whatever that incident may be, let's get our people to safety. Um, if we're in a condition that we can do so, render aid, help people out, call 911 if that's, if that's required for the type of incident that's happened. Um, render aid, help people that, that are in need. And then we start into a couple, a different angle on this. We want to preserve evidence. Jeff Rowley did a good presentation here about a week ago on sewer and uh, sewer and water main breaks and talked about spoliation of evidence. Now that's kind of a claim side of things, but it's also an important thing for us in our incident investigation. We don't wanna change an incident scene um, for our investigations, but sometimes there's a legal obligation for that. If there's a serious incident that we have to report to OSHA, um, they want that evidence to be in place, and there's a legal requirement for us to, to preserve that evidence. So don't be, don't be moving the stuff around the, the incident or cleaning it up and going back to work if it's a serious incident that, that has happened um, to preserve that, that evidence. Now I can do what I need to do to, to ensure safety of people, get people to safety, those types of things. All right, then we want to gather information. Information is so key. Without good information, we can't make good decisions. So how do we do that? So the supervisor is really the key in this. They're the first person on the scene in most cases. They know the job. They know the people. They know, they know the tools, all of those things. The data collection should rely on the supervisor or should fall to the supervisor. They also have accountability for their area as well. So supervisors should be trained on this. Supervisors should have the information <coughs> that um, forms and all of those things to help them do this. And then we want to use additional people as necessary. So people like our safety people. Um, sometimes we may bring in a consultant, somebody who has some special skills. Sometimes it might be Mike and Jason um, get, get the call to come in. We maybe need to do some sampling uh, for chemical exposures or something, something like that. Um, we, we may look outside because we don't have those skills within our organization. Okay, so let's talk about collecting the data. First of all, we want to interview people involved, particularly the people um, who were specifically involved. They were injured or they were part of the operation, um, not necessarily just witnesses. Now, witnesses are important. We want to gather their statements as well. 
but those per those people who were involved in what happened with the incident they're definitely ones that we want their information their statement we like to have things written down just because it's easy to um easier to collect that but sometimes we may do a recording of that um we want to capture information that's that's available if there's a process that's going on the machines that are used um, capture those types of things. Take pictures. Take pictures of the entire incident scene. So stand back. Um, get the big picture. Now we definitely take pictures of the of the tools involved and the and the damage that's that occurs. But really, let's look at the big picture. Let's write down what the what the uh, um, ambient conditions were. What what was the weather like? What was the lighting? Um, write those types of things down. Mike talked earlier today uh, about how quickly the weather changes in Utah this time of year. Well, how do we recreate that when we try to review this incident? We only we only can if we've if we have gathered that information and written it down. Sometimes we have to take measurements. Where did things where where were things located? Um, sometimes uh, measurements are really critical in decisions that we make. Where were were the guards in place? Um, what type of tools were used? What kind of condition were they in? Um, all of those things would gather information about the people involved. Um, were they were they trained on the on the operation? If they're a forklift operator, were they were they certified to be a forklift operator? Uh, those types of things are important. What was the um, what were the tasks that they were doing? What was the requirement in in uh, production? Uh, were we under any pressure to uh, to speed up our work? Okay, all kinds of things there, and we'll keep going on to those. Uh, whoops, did I? <laughs> All right. Um, and just a couple of key things here. Um, just the facts. When we collect this information, don't put any opinion. This is what I think happened. As a supervisor, as your, your team is out there collecting the information about this incident, um, we need to look at the facts. If it's a measurement, well, that's easy. That's a fact, right? I take my tape measure out and I measure measure this distance from one place to another, and I have my and I have my fact there. Um, but if we start putting opinion in there, then that's then that's not as effective, um, and that can sometimes cloud decisions that we make. So just gather the facts, and we will go in and take all of those facts and figure out why something happened after that. Okay. Moving on, tools. We have some tools that, that can help you out, and there are tools available uh, to you as well. Instant reports, and we will send out copies of, of these various forms to you um, if you signed up for the webinar and, uh, and by an email when the video's up. So instant reports are really nice because it gives us boxes to fill, boxes to check and lines to fill out. Um, it asks us questions. So if we're maybe not thinking all the way at what, what we need to, this is a, this is a great tool. Um, supervisor in instant investigation form, uh, pictures, um, policies, um, those types of uh, um, the documentation that tells employees how to do it, their forms that they use, the tools that they use, take pictures of those things. Oh, and by the way, um, when we go going back to that spoliation of evidence, if there was a tool involved um, that was damaged uh, or defective in one way or another, don't throw the thing away. We want to keep that. Let's uh, let's keep that. That is that is important evidence from a lot of different angles. And so we want to make sure that that's all that's all kept. Uh, interviews, um, uh, sampling results. If we need to take those for this type of a incident. Okay, so back to what I said before. Good decisions require good information, and so take the time to gather the information. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a, an instant review uh, with an organization. And sat down, sat down to review, and they really just didn't know what happened. Well, it looks like this probably happened. 
um, but they didn't have the information. I've been in uh, reviews where they, where we were talking about an eye injury, and uh, <laughs> and I asked the question: Was this person wearing safety glasses, and what kind of safety glasses were those? Uh, were were the glasses they were wearing? And they didn't have an idea of that. Well, those are the real basic things. You know, we weren't even looking at at the the really simple things. How are we going to get the overall uh, picture there? What was the weather like? What was, you know, things that may also be important, but uh, get good data so then we can make good decisions. Here's a couple of the forums. I know you can't see those on the screen very well, but those are the ones that we'll, we'll shoot out to you. Let's talk about the instant review process. Once we've gathered all of that data, um, we summarize it, put the data together, and we turn that over to our instant review team. For most of you, that's going to be your safety committee. Um, it may be an accident review board, uh, whatever you call it. It's a team. It's a group that takes a look at this. Who's involved in this team? Well, <clears throat> in most cases, the people that were involved in the incident, particularly the supervisor, maybe the person or persons that uh, were injured or, or were part of this, because they've got really important information. They were there. They, they participated in this. They know more about what happened than anybody because they were, they were involved. Management definitely needs to be a part of this. What level of management? Well, your top uh, executive should be either be involved or designate a person uh, to represent management on this on this board. People from safety and risk can participate as well, and others. We may we may have um, individ other individuals come in to help out with this process. Um, there's no fixed format on how we should do this, but I think it's I think it's important that we are consistent in how we do this and that we meet regularly. One challenge that I see with our with our review process is sometimes um, we end up with a list of twenty or thirty incidents that have happened because it's been six months since the last time we've met and uh and there's pressure on that hey you know we got a we got a half an hour to get through this through this meeting and we've got 10 more incidents and the and the tendency is that we just say check the box okay you know, operator error and and we're going to move on or non-preventable and move on because that's the easy way to do it um we want to have people from various different viewpoints, um, but we want people that are there who have a goal of improving the safety, improving the process, even if it hurts, because sometimes the process that we go through points a finger um, at our operations, at our policies, at how we do things and how we've always done things, and we may have to change some things. So let's talk about this review process. Um, we want to review all the pertinent information, take that information into account, and, and then make a decision around it. Well, this review can take place in a number of different ways, and, and don't look too close at this slide. I'm just, I'm just summarizing here the various different techniques that we can use. I'm going to go through one. I like a causal analysis just because it's easy and people can wrap their mind around it. These other ones, the fault tree analysis, we basically take an upside down tree and we, and we start um, at the instant and we go back through it and see where our faults are. There are various different ways to do it. Um, and they're all, they all have their benefits. Um, but I want to go through one that's, that's really simple and it works. And that's, that's really causal analysis or asking why until it hurts. Now, some, some people will call it five why. Ask why five times. I don't limit myself to that. I will probably ask why a lot more than that. And, uh, and here's another of the challenges that I see is a lot of times operator error is the default. Um, but what I've found over the years is that operator error usually isn't the root cause isn't the reason why this happens. Now, occasionally that happens, um, and uh, and we take appropriate action that way. Somebody makes an intentional decision there, but most of the time, 
there is a uh, there's something beyond operator error. It's a systemic issue. It's something in our processes, in our management, in our training, in our, you go down the list of all of these things that as an organization, we haven't, we haven't done to prevent this incident, um, or we have done that caused this incident. And those are the important ones. These are the things that will really make a difference writing up or firing or uh, chewing out an operator uh, of an employee for messing up will probably result in that person not doing it again. But you know what? I think the, the injury probably would result in that person not doing that <laughs> as well. Um, I'm not as worried about the person who was injured repeating that as I am everybody else that is doing that task. And that's really where we where we want to focus is as an organization, how do we make sure this never happens again? Because if I chop my finger off, chances are I am never going to get my finger near that machine or tool again because that really wasn't very nice. It hurt a lot and I don't have that finger anymore. Um, but if the if the condition still exists that caused that person to get their finger cut off, it's going to bite another finger off eventually. So how do we do this? I want to go through an, a quick example. I'm going to show a video to start with, and we're going to practice the five whys and see how we do. So here we go with the video. Okay, so here's the incident. We're at JB's, looks like a <laughs> looks like a restaurant, JB's or somewhere like that. And this guy is, and it wasn't it isn't JB's, so they don't they don't sue me for for maligning them. It's just looks like a restaurant. And there's a there's a conduit that goes down to the salad bar, and the maintenance guy um cuts the conduit well let's ask the question so or let's start from the from the process here's the incident an employee uh staff member um fell off a ladder and was injured okay let's start with a why why was this why was this person injured or why did he fall off the ladder well he fell off the ladder because he got shocked Okay, well, that was a pretty easy, uh, that was a pretty easy first why. Why did he get shocked? All right, not too hard yet. He got shocked because the power was on when he cut that conduit or cut that wire. Why was the, why was the power still on? Hmm, now it starts to get really kind of interesting, right? Because we can go a lot of different directions with this. And this is where our, our incident investigation, gathering data is, is, is really important. Why was the power on? Because if we go one way, um, it may be um, that the employee didn't know that the power needed to be turned off. Well, why is that? Well, we're starting to get somewhere, right? Well, he wasn't ever trained. We asked that important why there, he was not trained on doing this job. Why not? And you can see how this, how this will get to a point where as an organization, well, we didn't train him. Um, we don't have a training program. We hadn't ident identified the need for that, for that training program. Okay, or maybe, uh, and, and you can see where this could, this, we can keep asking why for a long time. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe this guy, it was his first day on the job. Why? It was his first day on the job. We just sent him out there to do the, do the job. Why did we do, why did we do that? We were under pressure. Okay, well, let's take a different direction. Why was the power not, why was the power not turned off? Well, um, because, because it wasn't, or because somebody turned it back on, right? He had turned the breaker off. Why, why was it turned back on? Well, because it wasn't locked out. Why not? 
because we don't have a lockout program. Or if we do have a lockout program, why wasn't why wasn't that breaker locked out? Um, and that can go interesting directions as well. Um, it could be that the employee just blew it off and said said ah, I don't need to. I've done this. I, I've done this before. Or it could be something the supervisor told him, just get it done. We got to hurry. We got lunch rush coming in. Um, and that and that uh, salad bar has been shocking people all day long. So just cut it. Just get it done. Well, that's, those are two totally different angles, but they definitely go back to our organization, organizational issues. Um, this is an easy way to ask the important question, which is why, and get us to the to the root cause or causes. Now, I know a lot of people talk about a root cause and there's one cause. I don't believe that. As a, as a safety professional over the years, I have dealt with, a, with um, hundreds, if not thousands of incident investigations. And, and there generally is, is one, uh, at least a couple there are a couple of uh, causes that go to this. There may be that one root cause, but um, most of the time there is a, a general cause and there are contributing factors, or sometimes there may be several. Keep asking why until it hurts, and then we're getting there, right? Because it's easy to point the finger of blame at a person, but as I ask why, more times it points back towards our organization. At the end of the day, we don't want to we don't want to whack somebody. We don't want to we don't want to point the finger of blame. We want to find out why this happened and how we can prevent it from happening again. Okay, all right, we covered that. Ask lots of questions. Um, look at all of the information that we have. Um, look at uh, look at what those reasons may be. Look at the equipment. Look at the people. Look at the training. Look at the policies. All of those are important. Now, some of you out there are like, "Well, that takes a lot of time." Yeah, it does. If we're serious about uh, preventing these these incidents. Now, that's why we have to prioritize how much effort we're going to put in. If I cut myself on, on a sheet of paper in the office, we're probably not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. We're still going to collect that information. And if we find trends, then we'll look at that. But if there's something that is serious, where somebody was seriously injured, or it was a near miss, where just a few inches or a, or a little bit of time different, we could have killed somebody, we will benefit. We will spend the time on doing those instant reviews, because otherwise, we we may end up having that happen. We may kill somebody the next time that it happens. Okay, what do we want to get to? Once we once we have asked why enough times and we've got down to it, then we want a concrete, corrective, or preventive action that we can that we can take and sometimes there may be 3 or 4 or a dozen corrective actions for what we've found through our why questions as we get to this point then it gets to, then it gets to where the rubber meets the road we got to do something we have to actually um, do some work to make this happen so this should all be documented right it should be on paper and it should be on an action register something that we collect the information, here's the corrective action, here's, here's the person that's responsible for it, and the date to have it done. And we follow up on those things. At the end of the day, we can spend a lot of time talking about accidents, but unless we do something, uh, we will probably won't prevent that accident. So identify that root cause, identify those uh, the, the why questions, and and then what is the thing that will prevent that from happening? Well, um, the guy fell off the ladder because he was shocked, and we didn't. And the power wasn't turned off. Why well, wasn't it turned off? Because we hadn't identified that we needed a lockout tagout program, and and so well now we have an action item. We need to stop all of our work on electri electricity until we have a program in place. We build a program and then we train our train our people on it. Uh, we buy the equipment that's necessary. We put that in place and then we monitor it. 
um, those are those are some simple actionable things that we can that we can do. So put those on a piece of paper and find those and track those to completion. Uh, so corrective actions are just an essential part. All right, folks, I knew this was going to end up long and I've, I had this goal to have it have it done um, in 40 minutes. So I'm right there to summarize. Um, investigate all accidents, all incidents that happen out there. Um, let's gather the information that we uh, that we have and take a real serious look at it. Be honest. It may hurt. It may be it may tell us that you know what the way we've always done this isn't good. It isn't the way it should be done, and and it's going to cost us some money. It's going to cost us some effort to fix that, um, and that's okay. Um, because I'm here to tell you that a fatality is is not access, acceptable. A serious accident is is not acceptable if we had an opportunity to to prevent those things. So let's go and in, go into it with that attitude in mind. I'm not going to be the person that allowed this to go forward. We're going to to put forth the effort and the time um, to to prevent the accident from happening again. All right, I said a lot of stuff. Um, if you guys got questions, comments, please type them into the chat box and, uh, and we'll answer those now. Mike, any thoughts? Uh, no, this is, this is great. I mean, I think you, you really hit on it is finding the root cause, not just looking to say, is it preventable or not preventable, right? It's let's figure out what the root cause was and then let's do better. Um, which is the biggest thing. And, and like you said, you know, there, there comes a time when it, turns around and it's like, man, if that's on me, I should have done something better. I, as the employer, as the supervisor, should have done something better to help this person. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, we did have a couple of questions. Uh, the question about, a rec Steve asked a question about a recommendation for regularly. And I'm sorry, Steve, I, I don't know what you're referring to. So maybe you could expound on that. Regularly, uh, probably how often to have to do this. And I, I would say on that, it's really based on your number of incidents that you have. Um, I I like to keep meetings as short as, as short as possible, right? And everybody else is busy. So, so if we look at that and say, hey, we're going to have a one hour meeting, um, you really base how often you have that meeting on the number of incidents that you have to review. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you end up with 20 incidents to review, well, that's, that's too much um, for your one hour time frame. And so that's where I would, that's where I would go with that. And I hope that's what it is. Looks like uh, the forms are going to be sent. We're going to send those uh, via email. It's asked if they'll be in PDF. I'll probably send those out in a Microsoft word format, maybe PDF as well. Um, and and the reason I put those into in the native form is so you can change them, um, make them work for your organization. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying these are the do all end all. They're things. They're questions that that I found have been helpful in the process. But take these and make them and make them yours. You know, make the forms work for you. Okay. Anything else I missed? Nope. That looks like it. Okay. All right, folks. Um, I, this is a discussion that we would love to have with with all of you out there. Um, we would love to attend uh, an instant review with you. So invite us. We're busy folks, and and so it may it may be a month or so before we can get to your your next one. But invite us out, and we'd love to walk through this process with you, um, and and we'd love to walk through it with your with your supervisors as well. All right. Just a, probably a last word from Jeff here then, Jason. Jeff, who's our, who's our claims manager. Um, we should have. Just taking the time needed to do an incident investigation, especially when it is a near miss, can feel like it is overkill or not necessary. However, I would much rather work through those feelings a hundred times than have to go through an incident review for a serious injury or fatality. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as a person that's been through, uh, that's been through, a number of of those really serious things. I absolutely concur with that, Jeff. Thank you. Absolutely. For, 
for that. Um, that is not something that anybody wants to go through. And, and, uh, and so let's take the time, let's put forth the effort mm -hmm. to, to review these incidents and make sure that we can say never again, this is not going to happen. So thanks folks. Appreciate your time. Uh, love to hear your comments. Uh, love to chat with you about this. Everybody go out and have a safe day. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.